Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. As Kyle mentioned, my name is Josh, for those of you who don't know me. And Kyle invites me to come and preach on occasion, and uh, it is always a pleasure to do so. If you would, open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and our reading this morning will be from verses 14 through 16. Hear now the words of the living and the true God. I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the nations, believed upon in the world, taken up in glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we get to gather together as your people, as your household. Lord, would you fill our hearts with thanksgiving towards you? that we would be grateful for all the work that you have done for us, that we would be grateful for the instruction that you have given us in your word. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see all that you have to teach us this morning, that you would help, help us, that you would soften our hearts to receive your word, that we would be corrected where correction is needed, and courage where encouragement is needed. And Lord, even though there are so many things going on in our lives right now, we ask that you would give us clarity of mind as we come to you in worship by the study of your word. May Jesus be lifted high. Amen. So today's message and passage, in a lot of ways, is um, a look back at uh, um, thematically what Kyle has been preaching on through the rest of First Timothy, through chapters 1 through 3. As we know, uh, uh, Timothy is an elder at the church at Ephesus, the leader of the church, the pastor, and there is much going on in that church that needs to be addressed, much that needs to be corrected. So Paul has written this letter, as we see in verse 14, that I write these things to you, hoping to come soon, but if I should be delayed, I have written. He sees these things as so important that he needs to write now, just in case. And so, as we look at this, all these things that, that, that we've looked at, whether it's the elders, what he must be, what he must not be, and everything else, this passage is a call to obey these as commands. It's a call to obedience. It's an exhortation, an encouragement, a strong encouragement that we ought to be carefully obeying out of love for God and with our gaze fixed on Jesus. And if we do that, we will safeguard the church and the gospel message. So, in order to be faithful to this text and kind of the, the, the rest of First Timothy 1 through 3, we're going to be going into a few topics today, including the authority and nature of Paul's writings, the need to obey God's commands today, the purpose of God's commands for his church, and the role that the obedience plays in upholding the truth. And it's important that we cover this. Because in today's day and age, there are so many who scoff at what Scripture has to say, particularly Paul. Whether it's our culture or even those who claim the name of Christ, they will come up with ways to reject or twist what has been written in order to not obey. And not obey plain commands that God has given us. 
So my goal and my prayer this morning is that even as we go through some of these commands and we, we preach to be faithful, and this is one of the things that is difficult, I find, as, as, as someone who has to handle God's word faithfully and give it to you, is we have to preach God's commands as commands. They are forceful, they are to be obeyed. And yet, and yet, we do not earn salvation. We do not earn status with God. So keep that in my hope is that you keep that in mind, that this doesn't become a burden to you or a, a, an item of legalism, that it isn't a checklist of things that we need to do to be good Christians or a good church, but that we would see that God has given these to us in their rightful place. So today's main points for our message is that Paul has given us commands that are to be followed. Second, the commands guide the behavior and the structure of the church. That's particularly what he has in view here in 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. And third, that the church is the pillar and guardian of truth. So with that, let's dive in. 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15, let's reread that section. I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. As we mentioned, Paul has been giving Timothy, an elder pastor, chosen to lead the church in Ephesus, chosen by Paul, chosen by the will of the Holy Spirit. He's been giving him commands such as what an elder must be, what he must not be. That they, might, that they must correct myths. Stop people from teaching endless genealogies and speculations, resulting in the abandonment of stewardship, resulting in vain discussion. They must stop this because it results in a lack of under... People teaching, having a lack of understanding regarding God's word, namely his law. He's been given formal instructions on worship, Specifically, men, pray, and you are to lead the church in prayer. That we are to pray for all people, including the persecuting kings, so that a quiet life may be led, so that they may come to see faith. Women are to be careful with how they dress, with modesty and self-control, not flaunting wealth, not flaunting beauty, but their godliness being put on display in their actions serving as the display of beauty. He tells us that women are to remain quiet and submissive. And what this means is that a woman is not permitted to teach or exercise authority over a man, as he clarifies, particularly within the, grand, the, the assembled church. And this isn't just an arbitrary claim. He grounds this in the creation and the fall and sees it as an ongoing standard and not one that has been uh, corrected or is no longer in force. And as we look at these passages, right, that's just a quick summary of the things that Paul has has covered here in the first three chapters. And some of them are obviously commands, especially when we look at the language, like an overseer must be above reproach. But what about the other ones that say, should I desire or I urge? Well, we find our answer in verse 15 here. I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves. In English, you know, we we see the word ought, and it's not really a, it can be a strong recommendation, but usually it carries an obligation or a moral weight to it. This is what you should be doing. This is what is expected. And it definitely indicates that requirement aspect in the Greek. Uh, the, the Greek word here is de, which communicates an obligation or compulsion. So some examples of this come from John 3, 7. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. And this is in order to receive eternal life. You must be born again. John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 9, 4, we must do the works of him 
who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Acts 5.29, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. 1 Timothy 3.2, therefore an overseer must, again, requirement, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Hebrews 11.6, now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And we find actually another translation that I find interesting, depending on the context, for this same word. And here are some examples of that, that this, this translation that is, it is necessary. Mark 13, 10, and it is necessary that the gospel be preached to all nations. Acts 26, 9, in fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary, Paul speaking, to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He felt that he was required, according to his old beliefs, before God saved him to treat the, the church the way he did with persecution, but he was wrong. And yet, it uses that same word, must, that obligation. Luke 9, 22, Jesus was saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed and be raised according to the third day, and raised the third day. So he is saying that these things Jesus must experience because it is prophesied. It is necessary. And again, Luke 19, 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. You see, these examples of the word day or must help us to see that Paul is communicating with great force that the things that he's telling Timothy and that he tells him to read, to give these things to the church are commands and they must be obeyed. The Ephesian church and Timothy must obey what Paul is saying. He isn't speaking about preference. He's speaking with the authority of an apostle who witnessed the risen Christ, who founded the Ephesian church and wrote a significant portion of the New Testament. And when we see Paul give these instructions, he does not say, it'd be a good idea, or this is my opinion, but... No, Paul recognizes that he's been given authority by God to instruct the church. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should recognize that what I write to you is the Lord's command. So Paul clearly thinks that when he's writing God's commands in 1 Corinthians 14, he is carrying God's authority. And that extends beyond 1 Corinthians. It extends into Galatians. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, and all the rest. But is Paul the only one who thought that he wrote with authority from God? No, he is not. In fact, if we turn to Peter's writings in 2 Peter 3, verses 14 through 16, this is what we read. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, Make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight at peace. Also regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters. There are some things hard to understand in them. The untaught and unstable will twist them to their own destruction as they do with the rest of the scriptures. So as we read what, what Peter has said about Paul's writings, which includes 1 Timothy, he says a few key things. Paul wrote in wisdom given by God. Paul speaks on the same things that Peter does. So neither speaks as an isolated witness. Peter is aware that Paul has written many letters for the church. Peter admits that Paul writes some things that are hard to understand, but are still in accordance with the wisdom given by God. 
We also see that Peter considers Paul's letters to be Scripture. And finally, that people attempt to twist and distort what Paul said, like they do with the rest of the Scriptures. So as we've seen, Paul thinks his commands are from God. His writings are from God. Peter says the same thing. Let's turn to two other passages that tell us about the nature of the other scriptures. So if you would, turn with me to 2 Peter 1. We'll be reading from verses 20 and 21. Above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And also another, another very well-known passage from Paul's second letter to Timothy. We see in... Uh, chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, that all Scripture is God-breathed or is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Not only do Peter and Paul view the Scriptures as authoritative and from God, but Jesus also views them as authoritative. Often when he corrects the, the, the religious teachers of his day, he says, have you not read? Again, he's pointing back to Scripture and their authority. In answering the devil's temptations, he, he says, it is written. And there is much more than this that we could actually dive into. Um, but I think this is clear evidence right here. It's enough for the purpose of today's message to demonstrate that all of Scripture is given by God. All the commands are from God and not man's opinion. And therefore, it was necessary that Timothy and the Ephesian church obey all that Paul had written in 1 Timothy. And by extension, as we'll discuss later, it is necessary that we also obey. Second, these are commands given to Timothy by Paul to govern the church. Again, but if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. <clears throat> we see here that Paul intends to visit Timothy and the Ephesian church, um, rather than, but, but rather than wait for a visit to deliver this message, he sees it as so important that he must write. Because he is a man. He doesn't know whether God will allow him to visit the Ephesian church or not. And as far as we know, it's unknown whether he actually made it there or not. So he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter. It was urgent. The church was experiencing great problems. And as we see earlier in the letter, these problems include false teaching, unqualified leadership, a lack of prayer, and people shipwrecking their faith. These problems needed to be addressed quickly to avoid any more damage being done to the church at Ephesus. And so Paul gives all the commands that we see in 1 Timothy chapters 1 through 3 with the aim that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. So as we saw in the previous point, they're, they're commands that carry an obligation, but they are intended for God's church. These commands are for the people of God to follow, especially as they govern the organization, leadership, doctrine, and behavior of God's people. While much of this is most easily applied um, to the church as it gathers, Paul says that this is for God's household. So let's just kind of take a step back and think about that aspect. The, the, these, these commands, this letter, is for God's household. At the most basic level, our households here in this room were, were families, 
right? Now, for those of us who have kids, right, um, we have rules in our household, and these rules are to govern how the children behave in the home, in our household. Now, question, do those rules go out the window when our children are at a friend's house? No, they don't. Don't talk like that. Don't go here. Don't watch that movie. Don't touch a hot stove. All those things don't go out the window just because they're not under your roof at the moment. These kids are still part of your household. So when the New Testament commands us to submit ourselves to our elders, we are not given the caveat, well, only submit when you're within the walls of the church. No. We are to submit to the spiritual authority of our pastors, elders, in the realm that God has given them authority, no matter where we are. You could be out having coffee and say, man, you've been struggling with a particular sin and pastors noticed, right? And he says, hey, you know, I'm concerned. This is, you know, I think this is something that needs to be corrected. Sorry, not at church, don't have to listen. No. We are still required to submit because we are part of God's household, and that is the authority structure that he has given us. And yes, while many of these commands, form, first and foremost, or at least most obviously apply to our, to, to our conduct as we gather here on Sundays, we don't see the kind of limiting factors that give us excuses to disobey. So, ultimately, what are the implications for these statements and what Paul's already written in this letter, right? So, first of all, all of, command, all of God's commands given through Paul are for today. So, let's just think about a few examples um, and, and how it applies today. Especially um, in our day and age, it's, it's good to look at a few because society tells us, no, 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 you don't need to do that. You don't need to obey that. That's not right. So if we look at 1 Timothy 3.2, we see Paul says, An elder, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. And in 1 Timothy 2.12-14, through 14, we see, that Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. As Kyle preached earlier in our study of 1 Timothy, these verses clearly teach us that God has determined that his church is to be taught and led by qualified men. And that is, meant, is offensive to many people today. It's offensive to our culture, which says that men and women are equal, that they can, they're not only equal in value, which God obviously tells us, but they're equal in function and role. They can be substituted back and forth, and in fact, you can change from one to the other. To say that men and women are different and have different roles in the home or society or even the church is offensive to our culture today. If that topic were to ever come up with some of our non-Christian friends and co-workers, they might say things like, you're a misogynist. You're a bigot. They accuse us of hating women, saying that we're oppressing women by, and keeping them down by not allowing them to exercise their abilities. They say that men who hold such views have fragile egos and are just trying to protect themselves protect their fragile egos in particular. And there are some who claim Christ, some of whom are, yes, brothers and sisters, who take great offense to this plain reading of Paul's commands, of God's commands. They instead say that, well, God has called both men and women to preach and pastor. There are even some within the Southern Baptist Convention trying to push for this to be accepted, trying to push for readings that the text doesn't have. 
to essentially say, oh, what you read isn't actually what the text is saying. They'll tell us that these are commands which were only for a church, the Ephesians, the, the church in Ephesus that had really bad issues when it came to women being disruptive. Or that they're accommodating the culture such that the church wouldn't be too offensive. Right? But here's the problem. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, 33-34, as in all of the churches of the saints, women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. So what Paul says here is that as in all the churches of the saints, he's saying, look, these, these commands that I've given you, this one especially, like I'm pointing out to you, it's an expectation of all of God's people. It's not just here. It's not just Corinth. It's not just Ephesus. It's not just Paul's day, it's, it's our day. So now, no matter how uncomfortable it is, no matter how much our anti-Christian culture or even professing Christians try to push back on us, we must always obey God. And this is just one example of unpopular commands of God in this book. Second, God's commands keep us focused. At the beginning of 1 Timothy, Paul gives us commands like do not teach false doctrine or pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Essentially, what he is saying here is don't teach false things or distract from God, namely the gospel. Let me give you an example of this. So before my wife and I moved up here to Spokane, we lived in Phoenix. And one of the things that we would do is uh, with some, some members from our church, we would go out and do street evangelism near the bar district at Arizona State University. We would see all kinds of groups out there. Sometimes you might see Mormons or Jehovah's Witness. Um, and there were other groups called Black Hebrew Israelites. Those are interesting. Um, but there is one in particular that I want to look at that I want to think about, that I want to tell you a story about. We ran into some flat earthers. One night, out of curiosity, I approached them because they had their signs and they were on the street corner in their group trying to tell people that the earth is flat and um, they need to believe that. So I approached them and struck up conversation because I was curious and I wanted to see if, hey, maybe do they need to hear the good news of Jesus too? Because um, everyone does. So I approached him and struck up a conversation, you know, and we got to the topic of Scripture because they try to point to the Bible as their proof for the earth being flat. And they fancy themselves Christians. So I asked him if he was a Christian, and he assured me he was, pointed to one of his signs which featured a short Bible verse. I asked him, so if you're a Christian, why are you out here trying to convince people that the earth is flat rather than telling them about Jesus? And his response was offense, great offense. He told me that they were there to disprove the lies of scientists and government first. And that was required to do that first before anybody could believe in Jesus. And what they did was keep, when, what did they keep promoting out there? The earth is flat, the earth is flat, the earth is flat. Myths. Endless genealogies, distractions from the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what they were promoting. They weren't leading anybody to Jesus out there. They were leading people into empty speculation. By following the commands that Paul gives, it helps us to avoid these distractions and falsehoods as we deal with false teachings, particularly as, as elders and leaders of the church are called to do so. Um, but not just, elders and teach, not just elders, but also each of us in our daily lives as we shepherd our children in our homes, as we, as we um, engage our world. Ultimately, the focus, our focus ought to be on the person and work of Jesus and it helps us to remember our sin, his grace, and the need to tell the world about him. 
and obedience to his commands, particularly ones about making sure we guard our doctrine and the teaching of the church, help us accomplish that. Another aspect of God's commands and their purpose is that they protect us. You know, as we have two young kids now, we're having to deal with setting those household rules that I was talking about earlier. Um, And one example in particular is, you know, don't touch the stove. You know, you know kids, they often think it's unloving or unfair to have rules being put on them. And they think it's doubly unfair when those rules are enforced with discipline. But what my toddler doesn't understand is that many of the rules that we have, like don't touch the stove, are for his protection. He doesn't know when the stove is on or off, or if it'll still be hot, even if it is off. So he better not touch it. It doesn't matter if the stove is off and he touches it. He needs to be disciplined. Why? Maybe it wasn't that time, but it will be the next time. It's better if he has a stinging hand and a few tears than a burned hand with oozing blisters because we never set boundaries for him. And that's one of the reasons that God gives us his commands. They're to protect us They're to protect us from bearing the wrath of God, from bearing consequences for our sin, for our disobedience. God is protecting us from harmful leadership. As we've heard from Kyle about his sermons on what an elder must be, we have to think about this. If a man is not the husband of one wife, in other words, a man who is faithful, who is chaste, who has himself under under control, you now allow for men to, who can prey on women and children in the congregation. The requirement that that, that an elder must be the husband of one wife is to protect the church. Also, that an elder must demonstrate self-control and not be a bully protects the church from angry and selfish leaders who cannot govern with wisdom and patience. The command that an elder must not be a new convert protects the church from being tossed about by every wind of doctrine. It protects from false teaching. It protects from the apostasy of an unproven man. It doesn't take long to think about these kinds of examples, these kinds of men who have been in the spotlight even in the last 10 years to only have great public failings bringing disgrace on their churches, their families, and themselves, and causing the world to look at the church and at Jesus with disgust because of the sin of their leaders rather than on the account of the offense of the cross. Fourth, God's instruction is to stir, is served to stir up love. You see, Paul says this right at the beginning of 1 Timothy. In in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. You see, obedience to these commands that God gives us stirs up love in multiple ways. Through obedience to God, we experience his protection from evil people and evil teachings and therefore A love is stirred up towards God on account of his wisdom. Oh, thank you, God, for protecting us. You are so wise. When we stay focused on the cross, love is stirred up toward God for his mercy. Oh, Lord, thank you for what you have done for us by forgiving our sin, rescuing us from the kingdom of darkness, and giving us eternal life and peace with you. When we obey God's instructions, a love is stored up within us toward our godly leaders. For we know that they are trustworthy men who will not abuse God's people, but are gently leading us according to God's word. And following the commands of God, stir up love for the unbeliever. And especially in light of today, this is important, especially our political opponents. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, 
for kings and all those who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. You know, I've heard it said that if you begin to pray for someone, especially for God to bless them, for God to save them, it's really hard to hold on to ungodly anger towards them. It's really hard for hatred to take root. And especially in this day and age, when many politicians do hate God, hate Christians, that they demand the right to slaughter unborn children, that they, they uh, promote genital mutilation as health care, we ought to have righteous anger. We ought to. We ought to have indignation towards those things. And yet, and we ought to cry out to the Lord, these evil ways be brought to an end. And yet we must remember Paul, who held himself up as an example, as a blasphemer, as a persecutor, whom God saved. So we are commanded to pray, to intercede for even our political enemies, that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. That they might repent so that the war being waged against God in our culture would end because God rescues them from their sin just as he has rescued us. There is no distinction. All of us need to be rescued from sin by Jesus Christ. Some of us just have been rescued already. And there's a world out there that still needs to be rescued. So in this election season, even as we push back against real evil, are we praying for our leaders and opponents that God would open their eyes? That he would save them? Are we willing to be the mouthpiece proclaiming the gospel in its fullness to our society and to its leaders? And finally, the last point. The church is the pillar and guardian of truth. So far, we've covered the fact that Paul has been giving instructions which are to be obeyed by the church and that there are multiple purposes for these commands that God has given to the church, right? But the overarching reason that Paul has given in today's passage for obedience is the description of of the church as the pillar and guardian of the truth. Now, you'll notice as you, if you look in your Bible at CSB or, or even other translations that I've, I've actually phrased it a little bit differently. The CSB translates the end of verse 15 as the pillar and foundation of truth. Some other translations render it differently. For example, the, the ESV describes the church as a pillar and buttress of truth. So we look at these translations and, and the commentaries and what they say about it. Um, If we just think about it, pillars and foundations serve largely the same function. They support a structure, right? So if we think about this in terms, if we were to prefer the, 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 the translation of the CSB, okay, we're supporting the truth. It's kind of just saying the same thing twice. But if we prefer a translation of pillar and buttress or something like that, we get a different picture. Yes, the pillar upholds, supports, and puts on display the structure, the truth. But a buttress is a source of defense. The church is to defend or guard the truth, not merely hold it up. And according to Paul, this is part of what the church inherently is and does. It's a supporter, a a, a displayer, and a guardian of truth, the truth. If the church does not obey God's commands, it is not defending the truth. If the church ceases to obey God, it stops putting the truth of God on display. So what is the truth? Well, as Jesus said in John 17, 17, as he's praying to God on our behalf, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. 
This takes us back to what we were talking about earlier, that, 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 that um, all of God's word is truth. All of God's word is authoritative. All of this Bible is from God, from his wisdom. And they have been given to us that we might know who God is, what he has done for us in Jesus, and how we might be saved from our sins. And the sad part is, as we've discussed, there are many who try to undermine God's word, calling into question the commands that God has given us. Calling into question the qualifications for elders, trying to twist God's word into such a pretzel that they tell us that the Bible doesn't say what it says. They say the Bible doesn't really say that women can be pastors. The Bible doesn't really say that committed homosexual relationships are sin. The Bible doesn't really say that Jesus rose from the dead. And the list can go on. If we do not obey all that Paul's commanded us, we functionally do not support, uphold, defend the truth found in the scriptures. If we, as a church, as a denomination, or as families, begin to compromise on these commands, on these truths, we will lose our foundation for everything. Everything. And namely, the mystery of godliness. You see, Paul ends this section here with what, what many commentators believe is, is a uh, portion of an old hymn. And he says, Most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. You see, the moment that we wriggle our way out of believing what the Bible says in one area, we set ourselves up for letting go of other areas. Sure, it might start off small, but it grows throughout time, especially over generations. This happened in Germany in the wake of the Enlightenment. First, there was a dependence on man's ability to reason. Then they began starting to explain away some of the miracles and things that Jesus said as being mythology. And as J. Gresham Machen said about this form of theological liberalism, which began in Germany and made its way over to the United States. He said this, a Jesus without the miracles is merely the flower of humanity. Jesus with the miracles is God in the flesh. Ultimately, the scholars who followed in this liberal tradition have denied everything that the Bible plainly teaches, including the nature of Jesus being God. And many churches have functionally done the same thing. The United Methodists, the Episcopalians, the uh, PCUSA began admitting women into the office of pastor elder, sinning, disobeying God's commands. And then they lost their defense against sexually deviant behavior. And now they have the whole spectrum of the LGBTQ in their pulpits, denying the sinfulness of sin, and therefore preaching a false gospel because you don't have to be saved from what God says you need to be saved from. If we as God's people do not uphold and defend the scriptures, we lose our foundation in our families for children obeying their parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. If you do this, you will live a long and fruitful life. Well, if we get to throw out a command here, why not that one? Why do our kids need to obey it? Why do they need to be respectful? If we let go of the authority of the scriptures and we stop defending them in their totality, we lose the requirement for men to lay down their lives and desires for their own families. We lose the command for women to submit to their husbands. We lose the fundamental understanding that marriages cannot simply be dissolved at will. And our society has already been reaping the consequences in the number of broken homes and violent and rebellious young people who do not take responsibility for their actions and their parents who only support this. When we cannot identify sin, we have lost the gospel. For what needs to be forgiven? Why did Jesus need to appear in the flesh? Why did he need to go to the cross? Why is he even being preached? 
We must take care that in our hearts, in our homes, in our church, in our denomination, in our culture, to embrace what God says, to proclaim it, and defend it. This is what the household of God does out of love for God and out of gratitude for the mercy that he has on us through his son. And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let us be careful to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus that we might out of love and gratitude do and be all that he has called us to be as a church and as individuals. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given commands to us to govern our church, to protect us, to protect the truth, to protect the, the, the good news of Jesus, that even though we have rebelled against you and deserve punishment for it, that you have made a way of escape, that if we would believe that Jesus is our way of escape, that we would turn our backs on our old lives, that you would rescue us. Help us to remember that. Help us to hold fiercely to the authority and the goodness of all of your word. Not just the parts that make us feel nice, but the parts that are sometimes hard to hold. Let us trust you and not depend on our own strength, but that we would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to love and obey and proclaim. Amen. Thank you.